I've had a few different opportunities to visit Normandy. And on both of the trips prior to this one, I, I took the time to visit the American cemetery as most American visitors probably do. And unfortunately, never took the time to visit the, the Commonwealth cemeteries. So today, I wanted to correct that mistake. And uh, we're going to be visiting a couple of places where the, the British of the Battle of Normandy are eternally laid to rest. The cemetery where I am currently standing is at Re Bosonville. And you might notice right off of the bat, if you've been to the American Cemetery or if you are familiar with it in any way, that uh, this is much smaller than the American Cemetery. Now that has nothing to do with the proportion of British soldiers who were killed to those of Americans. It's just that uh, the British and Canadians did things a, a little bit different. Uh, rather than reinterring all of their soldiers in one central location, well, there are several smaller cemeteries scattered all throughout Normandy. So each one of the men who were laid to rest in this cemetery were killed in this general vicinity. Well, as I may or may not have mentioned, uh, this is the first Commonwealth Cemetery that I've ever been to. So if you're British or Canadian, uh, you'll kind of have to pardon the, the newness of all of this to me. Uh, but man, this is so interesting to me. It's so different than the American cemeteries. Uh, for one thing, you can see, you know, it's almost like a, a garden here. And uh, another thing is if you look at the headstones, they actually have a lot more information on them about the soldier than, than what you see with the American headstones. And uh, I've got Paul Woodage from World War II TV with me here uh, to kind of help interpret these headstones. in a British cemetery or Commonwealth cemetery more correctly in Re Bazonville in Normandy. I want to, as a Brit, explain a little bit about how the British Army works with the regimental system. So regiments are usually created in somewhere with a regional um, connection, so a city or a county of England, and then pre-war there's normally a, a full regular battalion often on overseas duty so the regiment might have someone in India or Singapore then they'd have territorial or national guard you would be the American equivalent Ray, war raised battalions and so a regiment might have five six even ten battalions in a war but in different divisions around the world and so this little row of graves here the Cheshire regiment for example usually are machine gunners they normally provide regimental machine guns for a division along with the Middlesex regiment the reconnaissance corps the regiment in the British Army of the shortest ever history created in 1941 disbanded in 1946 piercing cavalry kind of equivalent of cavalry the South Staffordshire, so this is um, the kind of uh, northwest of England, this is kind of near Liverpool, Manchester, these kind of areas. There's a North Staffordshire, South Staffordshire. So when you're visiting a cemetery as an American, the cap badge is the local kind of connector for the individual soldier. They would have been serving as part of perhaps the 50th Division or the 3rd Division or the 49th Division. But if you ask a British soldier what, what, what unit he's in, he would probably give his regiment. So I'm in the... Uh, North Ants Yeomanry, I'm in the Somerset Light Infantry. An American would probably say his division, or maybe uh, he would probably say, I'm in the 36th Texas Division, or I'm in the uh, 29th Blue and Grey Division. It's just the difference how the British and Americans kind of refer to themselves. And the, the insignia has all sorts of um, connections with the past. So, for example, light infantry units always have a horn, a hunting horn. And this goes back to the earlier wars where hunting horns were used. Um, uh, for, for calling people on the field and they'd be light infantry are supposed to be moving faster 
Then you would have, there's a Navy guy here, the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, you see lots of stags, deers, sometimes they have like knights on horseback in air, uh, or you might see a castle which represents the fact that the regiment has fought in Egypt or Gibraltar in a previous war. So when you're a Brit like myself, you spot all the cap badges and the cap badges tell you the history of the regiment. It's a really fascinating uh, detail and also about the epitaphs. Everybody killed with the British or Commonwealth armies in World War II received a notification of death and sometime later they received a form where they could have uh, an epitaph. So uh, it could be a personal message or it could be a quote from the Bible or a bit of Shakespeare. And one of the things that I've been doing for the last 40 odd years of my life is going around and reading these epitaphs because just when you think you found the most moving one you find another one that's even more moving. So this one here, very simple, known unto God, because it's an unknown one. And then let's find one with a nice epitaph. Gone from us, but not forgotten, never shall thy memory fade, rest in peace. And if you see one without an epitaph, for example there, maybe he's an orphan, maybe there was no one there to, uh, to, to physically give uh, a, a, an epitaph to the British Army or to the, for the, um, documentation. Now here's something that is exceptionally interesting to me about this cemetery. The people buried here in Reed Bosonville aren't just British. There are also a lot of German soldiers buried right here in the exact same spot. Here is the headstone marking the grave of two unknown German soldiers. And here is one marking the grave of one unknown German soldier. And something that Paul pointed out to me that I found interesting is that whenever you walk amongst all of these headstones, well, there's one thing that you'll find you'll find a lot of young guys like uh, Conrad Skoldowski who was 20 years old and you'll also find a lot of older guys like Theodore Schaff but one thing you don't really see much of are guys in here who were in their late 20s or early 30s because by the time Normandy rolled around, a lot of those guys were already dead. They had fought uh, on the Eastern Front and in, in North Africa. And by the time Normandy rolls around, they're enlisting older men and uh, the younger guys are, are just being pretty much funneled right to the front. If you were an American killed in World War II, your family had two choices for how you could be buried. That if you're if you're to remain overseas in an American Battle Monuments Commission cemetery, that is either under a Star of David if you're Jewish, you identify as Jewish, or a cross if you're not Jewish. That's the two options. The British Army, the Commonwealth, actually has a wider variety of religions you could list as when you would join up the army. There are various, uh, Plymouth Brethren was a rather more obscure religion from the Southwest or Quakers. So along this row here, you have lots with the regular cross because they identified as Christian. You have a Jew here, the Pioneer Corps. Uh, on this grave here, Second Lieutenant B. Katzel has a Star of David on his grave because he would identify as Jewish. But what's interesting is this grave here. Now I don't know the particular story of Captain R.S. Jack of the South Staffordshire Regiment, but he has no cross on his grave. That's probably because either he didn't identify to a particular region or possibly he was even an atheist. And it means that you could be buried under different types of, of, of regulations, so to speak. So the great majority of these people are buried under a Christian cross, but you could still serve in the British Army. And if you had a non-designated uh, non religion, you could enter that on your documentation and you would be buried as this gentleman is here without any religious symbol. Well, I just find that really fascinating that there was a certain amount of individuality allowed to remain with a British soldier. And the, the American military, it's just the two options. Now, of course, that you can have Muslim burials and things like that now, but back at the time, 
it's either or. But this guy here, for whatever reason, has chosen to, to have an undesignated religion, and that is indicated on his grave. Here is the grave of A. Hunter, who was in the Royal Navy, died at the age of 20 on the 21st of August 1944, and on his epitaph it says, safely anchored. Uh, and then a few others here, we have an unknown soldier from the British military. And down here, look at this. Just to show you how things were getting a little bit desperate for Britain as well, um, here is R. McAlpine, who's a chief officer, so it, it's understandable that he would be a little bit older. And then here's a second engineer officer who was 58 whenever he was killed. All right, well, those are just uh, a few of the graves here at Re Bosenville. Uh, we're going to go down the road now and check out another one of these Commonwealth cemeteries. Well, the spot that I've moved to now is the Bayou War Cemetery. And I mentioned before that there are several of these Commonwealth cemeteries in the Normandy area. This one is the largest. And they, they have some things here that are honestly pretty impactful. Before I show any of the graves here at the Bayou War Cemetery, uh, I wanted to show this. This is the Bayou War Memorial and inscribed in the front is uh, the Latin phrase which translates to we once conquered by William have now set free the conqueror's native land in reference to uh, William the Conqueror leaving from Normandy and conquering Britain in 1066 in the invasion of England. Here you can see it says, the names of the soldiers of the British Commonwealth and Empire who fell in the assault upon the Normandy beaches or in the sweep to the Seine, but to whom the fortune of war denied a known and honored grave are recorded upon these walls, 6th of June to 29th of August, 1944. So engraved on these walls, are the names of 1,808 men who were never accounted for in the Battle of Normandy. This is a, a pretty interesting grave. This is the grave of First Officer H. L. Abrin. And uh, as you can see, he was, he was Jewish and died on the 7th of April, 1943. He was in the Royal Air Force, but if you look closer, well, there's a, a little bit more to his story. It says H. L. Abrin of the USA. This is an American who flew with the Royal Air Force and he is the only American buried in this cemetery. All right, now here is the main reason why I wanted to come to this cemetery. This right here is the final resting place of Sidney Bates, who was the recipient of the Victoria Cross. So if you watch the, the last episode of History Traveler, we talked about the Victoria Cross, how it's kind of like the British version of the Medal of Honor. If you look down here, it says his parents proudly remember him a true Camberwell boy and a loving son. So uh, I'll let you look up the, the story of Sidney Bates yourself. Pretty incredible thing that, that he did. And uh, he rests right here in this cemetery.
Well, that was just a few of the Commonwealth cemeteries here in Normandy. If you ever have a, a chance to travel to this region, definitely stop at a few of these cemeteries and spend some time walking out amongst these headstones. Read the epitaphs and, and kind of uh, feel the, the personal connection that, that these men had with their family. They all had a story. Uh, they, they all had families and loved ones that, that they left behind here. Uh, and, and read what regiments they came from and then use that as an opportunity to go and learn a little bit more about what they did during the Battle of Normandy. So glad that we stopped at these places today. Uh, very, very impactful.